I'm ready when you are, Buzzy. We're on. Okay. Aren't you guys glad to see me today? <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Stand with me. This morning, as before I open the service, I want to, I don't know how many of you know about this revival that has broke out in Asbury, Kentucky. And the Holy Spirit is doing a work there. And I'm going to tell you something. I viewed it on YouTube yesterday, and I told Pastor, I said, it is amazing to see what God is Amen. doing. And, but let me tell you why God is doing it. I got the inside scoop. And what he's doing it, the reason he's doing it is because of three things. Those young people that are there in middle age and some older ones, they are worshiping. They are praising the Lord. They're not ashamed, just exactly what we sang. We're not ashamed to praise the Lord. Now, I tell you something. When you get to the place where you're not ashamed, God can work through your life. Amen. And so they're not ashamed to praise the Lord. They're worshiping. They're praising. And they are in prayer today. Thank you, Lord. So it's carried over, at least that I know of safely, Ten days, day and night. And I thought, woo, isn't that amazing yeah. what God is doing? But guess what? <laughs> Last Sunday, a little bit, we called, used to call it the afterglow, just praising and worshiping God. Look what happened. God's Spirit came in here and touched the lives of people. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you've never been touched by God before. But when the Holy Spirit touches your life, something moves inside of you. His Spirit begins to deal with you. So this morning, as we prepare to open, you see, every time God moves, guess who else moves? The ugly one. The devil moves. He does not like it. He wants to stop the move of God. He can only stop the move of God by you allowing him to. So this morning, as we prepare to praise, to worship, and hear the word of God, this is the one thing that is deep inside of my heart. I always believe in letting the Holy Ghost move. He's the one that's going to change your life. Amen. He's the one that's going to make the difference. He's the one that convicts us of sin. He's the one that does it all in the name of Jesus Amen. today. So open your heart to him this morning. Open your spirit to him to say, Lord, whatever you want to do in my life, I want because I want to sense and feel your presence today. First and foremost, bow your heads with me. Father, right now Glory we come you, Lord. and we take the Give authority that's in the name of Jesus Christ today. Satan, we bind your every yes. working because we Jesus. know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. Father, we ask that you bless us, you strengthen, you encourage, but opening our hearts and our minds as we give yes, you all Lord. the praise, honor, and glory for it because this is the day that you have made. You we'll forward. rejoice in it. Glory we won't you, leave Lord. here like we came. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' praise name. Amen. And give him praise today. Amen. To Start it off right. Well, come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Give him praise. Give him praise. To his presence, thanksgiving in your heart, your voice is raised, your voice is raised, give glory and honor and power unto him, Jesus, name above all name. Come on now, come to his presence. Thanksgiving in your heart, voices raised, voices raised. 
Thank you, Lord. people have such a hard time opening up to God, but oftentimes, even when we have people come forward for prayer, we have to tell them, raise your hands and say this, because people go, you know, since I had this stroke, the muscles on this side of my body want to play games with me, and so what they'll do is they'll seize up, and when they do seize up, my leg jerks up, and my hand wants to reach up and slap my face. <laughs> and it, it's not very comfortable. But we often see people do that very thing with their whole body. <laughs> you come up for prayer, and they go, well, what's with that? If oh, God man. inhabits the praises of his people, yes, he does. then doesn't it stand to reason that you can get some antenna? Mm-hmm. In? into the air yes doesn't it stand a reason that you can once in a while open your mouth glory you to holler at your dog don't you <laughs> i do it yours you do it mine <laughs> people i want you to worship god yes, this morning hallelujah that's what happened last sunday after the service uh-huh. was over people were worshiping god yes that's when you. God comes in and does what you need to have done. Thank you, Lord. You, Thank you're Lord. not here today without a need. That's right. You're in as much need as I am. Some of your bodies hurt this morning. Yep. But this is not the answer. No, it isn't. Nope. That's not the answer. The answer is to get with it. Get Amen. plugged in. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Sing it one more time, Leo. Praise you today, Lord. Praise you. Let's see how loud we can sing, okay? Oh, oh come into his presence with thanksgiving in your own and give him praise. Give him praise. Oh, come into his presence with thanksgiving in your own. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Praises ring out today. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. We sing the praise. 
That, can't we? Mm-hmm. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are so good to you.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. We worship you today. It's all about you. It's not about us. It's about you today, Majesty. You're worthy this morning, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy. Glory to God. Glory to God. King of 
faster. God today. You know, the scripture teaches that if you don't praise the Lord, that God will raise up, as a matter of fact, He will, the rocks, thank you, that the rocks will cry out. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want a rock crying out for me. Amen. Do you? You know what? We're, this group back here, I want you to understand something. They don't just get up here and do this for the fun of it. They get up in here and do this for purpose. And that purpose is to get you to praise and worship God. And that's it. They're giving their gifts, using their gifts and their talent to do one thing, to glorify God. And I'm going to tell you something, people. In these last days, you're going to have to get with the program because if you don't get with the program, you may be left behind. And that's what God asked us to do. Simply do what you know is right. Learn to worship. Learn to praise a holy God. I don't know about you, but when God does something for me, I don't have a bit of problem praising him. Do you? But I'll guarantee you when the enemy comes in like a flood, you're going to need God. Because this week I've needed God more this week than I did last week. Because it seems to me like it's getting tougher. It's getting tougher because we're being attacked from every area. And people, it's important that you learn. There's only a couple of ways that you're going to get through it. And that's praising God 
worshiping him, putting yourself out a little bit. Come on, amen. Put yourself out a little bit. I'm probably old as most of you in here. If I can raise my arm, you can raise yours. Amen? Well, uh, certain ones can. But you need to learn to worship God. It's important to you. As well as your giving. You see, the enemy doesn't attack unless you're doing something. Did you hear me? If he's not attacking you, you're not doing anything. Now... It's not a fun place to be, but nevertheless, it's, it's his word. And last week, the offering was wonderful. The missions was even better. And the jar on the end for the workers, I got to pay two workers this week. By the way, the one worker that I put him on doing a job, I want you to know, ladies, he put us to shame. He put us to shame. Because if you don't believe me, you go there and look in that annex and you see what he did. And I thought, oh, Lord, I had to leave early. Yeah, but he has muscles. Well, that's true. He has muscles. But I guarantee you one thing, he did an excellent job with yes, those muscles. Did. And so I believe in giving praises and baskets of flowers while you're here. So what I was telling you was the enemy. Sunday, we had a wonderful day. We felt the presence of God. The offering them was wonderful. And guess what happened this week? The enemy said, enough of that. But you and I are the only ones that can stop him. And you know you have authority in the name of Jesus as well as I do. And I want him under my feet. Nowhere else. And the only way to do that is to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit pray seek his face and keep on keeping on amen are you ready to give this morning it's important that you learn to give because it's part of your worship it's part of your worship so stand with me this morning please heavenly father bless the gift and the giver teach us together to learn to this is part of our worship as we give back a portion of what you have blessed us with we'll be careful to give you all the praise honor and glory for it in jesus name and everyone said praise the lord, praise the lord. bring your offer i got the holy ghost down in my soul just like the bible says i got the holy ghost down in my soul just like the bible I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible said. When I've been to the river and I've been baptized, I'm so God happy and I feel alright. Got my hands on the gospel, and I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Just like the Bible, just like the Bible, just like the Bible said. Down in my soul. too much to me. <laughs> Whoop. One of us, probably me. It's you. 
Okay. You're the Wait. one that's making that sound. <laughs> okay. Oh, you want to sing at this time? Yeah, what do you think okay. about it? I got about five minutes. They say you can do what that. What do you think, huh? I don't know that song. But if you want to do it, we'll let you do it. Let's try it and see. Pastor wants to sing a special this morning. <laughs> My voice is not up to where it I needs to be. Okay. You want to help me, baby? <laughs> you can. This is a... Uh, an old, old song that I ran t into. Yeah, Leo, if you want to, you can help me out here. <laughs> I haven't practiced this with uh, G, C, and D. <laughs> what else? Um, I'm working on my voice. My voice does not have the quality that it has had uh, in the past. Or the stamina. Or the stamina. Yeah. Sometimes I lose my breath. But I think this song goes with this morning. I've been practicing it at home by myself. And uh, Jasmine has consented and Leo to try to help me here. We're going to do the best that we can. I just think that this old song goes with the service okay, honey. today. Well, heaven.
Yes, it does. It goes right with my message today, as a matter of fact. Well, I, I don't know how good it was, but I tried. It was good. It was good. <laughs> I would think that would be something that would make us all shudder a little bit, is for to even think that when we face Jesus Christ, when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. There are many, many people out there today, and, and he's talking about these messages about the parables, because they are so <laughs> they are so important because they're the words of Jesus. This is how he feels about something and what he has to say, and so it's very, very important that we pay attention to them and learn how he feels about something. <laughs> I doubt very seriously you could do that, Pastor. <laughs> Title of my message to you today is just three parables because they're going to be close together and I chose two of them are actually speaking along the same lines. We're continuing on this series because these parables, like I said, they are very, very important. I pray that you are learning something from the teaching of each and every one of them. I want to get right into them. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. I'll give you a minute to get there. You must see it in the Word because you know that the Word is truth. We're going to start with verse 44 through 46. And again, the kingdom of heaven, this is the parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, he buys that field. Verse 45 is the parable of the pearl of great price. When these two are connected, the kingdom of heaven is like, again, a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now keep your uh, finger there or your bookmark because we're going to use for the last one the parable of the dragnet. But first and foremost, we ask the blessing of the Lord upon the reading of his word. Help the words of the messenger to go deep within our hearts, transform our thinking into the way that he thinks. Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, praise the Lord. This parable sounds a little strange and unusual to us, but not to the people in Palestine in the days of Jesus. People in ordinary everyday practice use the ground as the safest place to keep their most cherished belongings. Remember, if you know your Bible, the parable of the talents, the unprofitable servant, he hid his talent where? In the ground, lest he lose it. You see, Jesus was a little bit upset with that one. You can find it in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 25. But they used the earth to bury their valuables and sometimes their money. I have read of many people who put their money in and bury it in the backyard instead of putting it in the bank. Have you? <laughs> and, you know, Pastor and I, uh, having a smog shop for many years, came across a man that had a tow truck service. Correct, Pastor? And I think there was anywhere from he would take his money and put it in cylinders, metal, Two-inch two pipe with caps on it, $100 bills. And I think that um, and actually when he died, his, this, the next guy that took his uh, place, he found it. And there was, yeah, anywhere from twenty to $25,000 in it. His wife, that, the guy's wife didn't get the money, by the way. The other guy got the money. But you see, people... How many of you, now, no, they're not seeing you on TV, so you can be safe with me. How many have ever put their money in something in the freezer? I've done that before. 
And I learned quickly, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you see, this is what they're talking about here, that it was just a common practice for people to hide their valuables in the ground, you know. I actually read of one um, country and western older man that he buried his in the backyard. Some people knew where it was, but as a matter of fact, they were on his property there to get it. But in his, uh, he used to wear overalls a lot, and he had $3,000 in the, the pocket of that overall. So you got to be real careful with that kind of stuff, you know. This parable represents Jesus as the man. This is just part of it. And the treasure in the field, it also has the, it can represent potential believers who are in the world. Now, this man that this is talking about, he found something precious, very precious. And he didn't find it, not so much by chance, but as in his daily work. This is how he found it. It's, it's actually true to say that he stumbled unexpectedly upon it, but he did it when he was going about his daily business. Now, how many times have any of you found something by, uh, of value, by the way, while you were going about your day? I have. A couple of you have. Pastor and I, when we were pastoring in Oregon, um, we had changed cars and got a different car, and uh, I was outside cleaning, vacuuming it out, and cleaning some things in it, and I stuck the vacuum cleaner, the not long part of it, down in the side of it, and I thought, what is that? And I kept trying. Finally, I got my hand down in the side of it, pulled it up, and it was a wallet, and it was that thick. And I opened it up. We'd had the car about a week and a half, I guess, and... I opened it up, and there was $350 in it. I went, woohoo! look what I found. Well, there was also a license in it, and there was a man's name in it. And so Pastor and I went, the man was in the military, in the Navy, so we called every registrar we could to try to find the man and uh, to return the money to him. And so, to no avail, by the way, the man... The one registrar said that he's probably out of the military by now. So, what's that old saying? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. So, <laughs> I spent his money, didn't I, Pastor? <laughs> now, what this is actually portraying to us, this parable, another part of this is, is to say that it would be sad for us today to say, Maybe not to you, but to me. That I only felt the presence of God when I'm here in this church. You see, this is what he's talking about. Some great uh, hidden treasures there. I don't know how you feel, but you must understand that the presence of God is a treasure. Sometimes it's hidden. Sometimes God doesn't automatically just swoop in. Why? You ever wonder why? You see... I get close to God. I don't wait to come to church to get close to God. Can I get a witness? I stay close to God on Monday as well as I do on Sunday. This is what he's talking about. True happiness, true satisfaction, the sense of God himself, the presence of Jesus Christ are found in everyday jobs that you do, in your home, your work. That is, I added this to this, I personally believe this, that when you do an honest day's work. You see, can you go to work and be dishonest? Yes, you can. I know of many, many people who do it. They don't give their job, their worker, uh, their boss the best. They give them like, I'm here today and I really wish I was home. You see? But remember what we're talking about. There was a man many, many years ago. His name was Brother Lawrence. He was actually a monk, and he was a great saint of God. He spent much of his working life in the monastery kitchen among the dirty dishes, piles of dirty dishes, 
big pots and pans. But this man made a statement. And that was back in maybe the 1700s. But that statement is still true today. He said, I felt Jesus Christ as close to me in the kitchen as I ever did at the communion table, the sacrament table. You see, he coined a phrase right there. It's called practicing the presence of God. There's a book out, as a matter of fact. I bought it when I first, uh, many, many years ago. And when I heard of it, and I thought, it's amazing to read about some of these men of old and the experiences they've had. And I've had similar experiences myself. Have you? You see, what this parable is really consisting of is you and me living our lives daily for Jesus Christ, finding pleasure and joy in doing so. There are a lot of people today, Christians, they call themselves Christians, they do not enjoy their salvation. I remember years ago when a woman led some of her kids to the Lord, one of them made this statement, and I got wind of it. She made the statement, someone, the pastor said, do you enjoy your salvation or do you tolerate it? She said, I tolerate mine. Did you know she's not saved today? Anybody that tolerates their salvation, I would venture to say, will not make heaven. Amen. Why? Your heart's not after God. It's after you. There are many people today who will not accept Jesus Christ because they feel they have to give up something. Oh, how many times I have heard this in 50-some years. It's amazing to me. No, I would have to give up this. Usually it's a habit. Boy, people, I'm going to tell you something. We're really good with our habits. Come on, get with me. I don't like somebody to touch my habit. I think we're all like that to a certain degree. In reality, Jesus wants to be a part of everything in your life. Everything in your life, not just one thing. But it's up to you to let him be in every part of your life. I know believers that let Jesus be in their life on Sunday morning only. Do you? You see, Jesus Christ is about relationships. I guarantee you, if I just spoke to Pastor once on Sunday morning, well, he might be happy on some days. <laughs> but my relationship is based daily with him, not weekly. And that's the same way your relationship should be with Jesus Christ, on a daily basis. You see, it's up to you people how much of God and the Lord Jesus Christ in your life that you really want. That second parable, we, go, we went right into it for a reason. Because that second parable is about looking for fine pearls. How many of you have a pearl? You have a pearl. Ring, uh, jewelry, any, any type. I have one. You see it right there? That's called a black pearl. And I've had it for 15 years. And so this morning I thought, that's going to go with my sermon today. It, this one is called the Pearl of Great Price. Now, I don't know how many of you know this story. It's, a, it's true, but it's in my message. The pearl is actually born, each one of them are born out of suffering. A speck of sand or a parasite. A parasite is simply like a plant or an animal that feeds off of another and this is why you can even use that with human beings. When people take advantage of other people, they're like a parasite. They don't do anything for themselves, but they feed off of others. Can I get a witness? Okay, this speck of sand makes its way into that oyster. Now, maybe you didn't know this, but the oyster is actually a living organism. So the intruder, which is that speck of sand... It hurts the oyster. It gets in there, and it rubs, and it hurts. So the intruder is, is actually doing something there. Now, how many of you ever had a grain of sand get in your eye? 
or something in your eye. Isn't that awful? Doesn't that feel terrible? Now you know how that oyster feels. That's the same thing that he's going through. So to protect himself, that oyster secretes a substance. It's actually called, the word for it is nacre. This is not a word you and I would use every day, but we can use it in referring to this. It's called the mother of pearl. It surrounds that intruder that's in that oyster. Now, it's this secretion that gradually, little by little, it forms. It builds up. And that's how it forms a pearl. When you open it up, you've seen those movies where they open up an oyster and there's a gigantic pearl? That thing, so most of the time they're about this size. They're not really that big. But that pearl is born out of much torment and pain. The same, now what does that mean for us? The same is true of believers in the church. Both are born out of suffering and out of the wounds of Jesus Christ. And he has made possible by this by his death and his sacrifice. Romans 5, 8 through 10, it tells you, Christ died for you while you were still a sinner. Amen. Amen. He died for all of us while we were still sinners. In this day and time, people love pearls and desire to possess them. I think the same today. People like pearls. They like diamonds as well. But today we're talking about pearls. Now, what does this really mean? There's some truths in this parable. The kingdom of heaven is compared to a pearl. It is the loveliest thing to think about or look at. How many of you have an idea in your mind, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, what a heaven is going to look like? When they say the streets of gold, I don't know about you, but I can't fathom that. Uh, streets of gold. There's going to be, I think there's 12 disciples, there was 12 pillars, and on each one is gems and different things. There's pearls going to be there, by the way, and I have a feeling they're not going to be little pearls. They're going to be big ones. You see, that's what's called the finer things in this world. In this world, we do have some things that we call, that's a nice thing. You can find the word would be loveliness. Now, when I think of heaven, I think of loveliness. It's going to be wonderful there. Beauty. Now, we can find this and different things in our world. How many of you like art, beautiful art? I love art. I have a few, and uh, somebody else I know has a few Thomas Kincaid paintings. The first time I ever saw that man paint something was in a mall years ago before he died. And I was in a, my daughter and I were there, and I saw it, and I said, ooh, that painting, there was 15 paintings in that room, but that one painting drew me. And I told her, I said, that's beautiful. I love that. I still have that painting, by the way. When I look at it, I think of something, it's just beautiful. I put myself in the painting. You see, it's a bridge, and it has water, a cottage at the side. It's quiet, and it's peaceful. How many of you find loveliness in music? Oh, a lot of people love music. Different kinds of music. Now, I know most of you are not going to probably understand me when I say this, but I love classical music. <laughs> Pastor, I was listening to someone the other night, and he was in his chair, and I was listening to somebody sing classical music. And he said, I don't get that. And I, he said, I don't understand that, and I don't get it, and I'm not really sure about it. And I said, you don't have to be. That kind of music speaks to your emotions. It speaks without you having to say anything, because it, it touches something inside of people where you see it in a different light. I see that music in a different light. Pastor may see it in country and western music. You may see it in contemporary music. It's the same principle. You see, there's something that moves you in the beauty of that music. It's supposed to, by the way. 
You can find loveliness in knowledge. Now, I know a lot of people today may not find that, but I'm telling you something. Your knowledge is power. You don't have any knowledge. You don't have no power. Maybe this one will help you. Can you find that loveliness in something that you've overcome in your life? You finally, you worked and worked and worked. Maybe you got a degree. Maybe you did something with your life. Maybe you just accomplished something in your life. I know a lot of people today that they, they find joy and happiness in their accomplishments. Nothing wrong with that. You should. That's the way God created us. But these are just what's classified as pearls. That's a small pearl. It can mean anything for anybody. But there is a supreme pearl that you and I can have. And that is, this is how God views us with a pearl. It's the willing, now listen to me closely, the willing obedience that you and I give him. Think about that. You see, did you know that that willing obedience actually makes you a friend of God? I can prove it to you. I know a lot of believers today. They are saved, but they're not friends of God. Why? Because they're not willing and obedient to him. John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, If you love me, you will keep my what? His commands. That's willingly obedient to keep his commands. Another one is John 15, 10. You see, you can be saved. I'm not saying that you're not saved, but I'm telling you something. In order to be a friend of God, you better be obedient. And you better be willing. Now, sometimes I'd been obedient to God, and I definitely didn't want to be willing. Have you? But I've still done it. I've still been obedient. He told me one time, he said, with pastor, he said, go and apologize. I said, he started it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I didn't hear anything. I just kept laying there. Pastor was upstairs. We had a uh, bedroom upstairs in an office. He went upstairs. He slammed the door, by the way. <laughs> and I said, the Holy Spirit said, go apologize. I said, nope, he started it. And I said, a few minutes later, didn't hear anything. A few minutes later, he said, I said, go apologize. Ooh, I went kicking and screaming every step I took up that thing. And I, I thought, he's just going to yell at me when I get there anyway. <laughs> But I was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I said, Lord, by the time I got up there, I wanted to look at him. Oh, guess what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Every step I took, the Lord tempered my spirit. Because I've learned the value of humbling yourself. Because God will lift you up. He'll be the one to touch your life. He will give you joy, peace, and love in your heart that you will not be able to explain it. Being obedient to God is more important, and it should be more important to us all than anything. Your obedience level, by the way, can be seen. Not only by the Lord, but it can be seen by other people. Did you know that? Amen. Yes, it can be seen. You don't have to convince Jesus that you're obedient to him. He already knows if you're obedient or not to him. It's pretty obvious sometimes when we're not. Can I get a witness? There's a lot of things I could go into about this disobedience when it comes to not being obedient to God. But when I, we sing that song, I'm a friend of God, I am a friend of God. You see, he knows me inside and out, because I let him know me. And that's what he wants. He wants children that are submissive yes. and obedient and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, 
It's very important that you learn that because it's called willing submissiveness to the will of God. You and I can be submissive. And by the way, did you know we are supposed to be submissive one to another? Can I see your hands? We are to be submissive one to one another. Well, I had a man tell me this and a woman too at different times. This is actually what he told me. Well, I'm submissive to God. He was a big guy, tall guy. And he said, I'm submissive to God, but I don't really care about the leaders. I thought, whoa. I, I looked at him, I said, I think you got that backwards. He, and he said, what? And I said, the Bible teaches you this. When you are, you cannot be submissive to God if you're not submissive to leaders. Let's try making your boss mad and not doing what he wants. How long do you think you'll keep that job? Not very long. You must learn. This submission level is something that can be seen, and it can be seen by other people too. You can hear it. You can see it. You can know it. And you have to be very, very careful because you can't be just say you're submissive to God and not anyone else. How many of you realize we all got somebody over us? I'll never forget the day that Pastor got railed in it back then. I think it didn't, wasn't it still at Kmart? Is that where we were with that? And woo, I could hear the superior guy jumping all over him. I thought, where can I hide? He was being called on the carpet for something that he didn't even do. And I thought, I was just a little ways from him. And I began to make intercession. Lord God, help Pastor not to blow up. And tell the superior, because he was over us both. You see, we have people over us as well as you have people over you. And, this, and I think it's rightly so, because last week I shared that with you. Remember when I talked about the police officers, the fire chief, and different ones? Uh, we get mad at police officers because they give us a ticket because we're speeding. Uh, does that make sense? <laughs> what about, you know, uh, I don't know. God, chapter 13 in Romans tells you, obey the what? Authority. Very, very important that you learn to do that. Oh, by the way, can I just throw this in? It, God will have you put in a situation where you will do it. He'll test you. He will test everything in your heart. Absolutely everything. You get in the right... Wh what, Pastor? <laughs> okay. Pastor needs a pat on the back today, so I'm going to have to give it to him. Well, Pastor sucked it up and said, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I was waiting just a little ways from him, I was waiting for a full glow of the Holy Spirit to come up on him because I thought, wow, wow. <laughs> he submitted to the leadership. Now, that is not to say that sometimes he did a little bit of griping now and then, but it's like I told him, I said, being obedient to God is the most important thing that you and I can do. Say amen. Very important. The last one, let's go to the scripture there, the parable of the dragnet. Verse 47, chapter 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Notice all three of them talk about the kingdom of heaven. It's like a dragnet or a net which cast into the sea. It gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. They sat down and gathered the good into the vessels. That means containers. But they threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I hope you don't think of this. I thought, ooh, 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 that's, that's really a tough one. The net is the kingdom of heaven. The gospel is the message of the kingdom. The sea is the world in all the depths of its darkness and its unknown. The fisherman represents Jesus Christ and, and his followers, you and me. The net is cast into the sea. Christ and his true followers cast the net of the gospel into the world. Now, 
What happens? They work hard at fishing for men and women. How many of you ever used to fish? I used to fish with Pastor an awful lot. By the way, I might as well just tell you this. At one time, I beat him really good. I caught two fish at one time. And I beat him. Right, Pastor? <laughs> That's right. And so he was the fisherman. But, oh, I, I love that. But you know what those fish did every time I tried to reel them in? They resisted. They resisted. You see, that's what happened to men and women that go fishing with the gospel. They resist you. They don't want to hear that Jesus can save them. They resist. But you have to understand what this parable, what he was saying. Nevertheless, you're still supposed to go fishing. You're supposed to fish for those unsaved people, backslidden people. Notice what happened when the net was cast into the sea. The net gathered every kind of fish. You ever fished and gained even with a net and came up with three or four different kinds of fish? That's what he's talking about. What does that mean to you and me? This means a mixture. It was a mixture of good with the bad. Right here, this is where he's talking about hypocrites in the church. I remember a man said this to me probably 40 years ago. Well, I don't want to go to church down there. That church is filled with hypocrites. And I thought, the church has to be filled with hypocrites. We're just sinners saved by grace. He's talking about those people, though, that are bad in this light. Remember what we said. Jesus said that not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to make heaven. There are some reasons why some of the bad, or we would call them unconverted people, wanted to be in that net. What's that net? The church. They want to be part of the earthly church. Now, maybe you've never seen this, because Pastor and I probably have had more opportunities to see this than you have. But the church offers things to people, ungodly people as well. It offers fellowship. Uh, I knew a man, Pastor and I both knew him. Some of you in this church knew him many, many years ago. He used to live here in Woodville. He didn't even have one friend. He was a young man. And, but he always went to church. Always went to church. Why? He was lonely. And he was empty inside. That, that's different reasons why. And the church would meet that need. You see, just because we have a tendency to think that we go to church to worship, everybody doesn't feel that way. Hear me. They don't all feel that way. The church meets needs of people. That's what it's all about. And sometimes the church instills a sense of spiritual security to some people. What, it, what does that mean? That means that they feel like, well, when I go to church every Sunday, God's going to accept, accept me, and he's going to be pleased with me And if I do these things. Okay? That's okay to think that, but that better not be your motive. You see, the disciples had a lot to say. If you study the scriptures long enough, you'll learn this, especially when you go back into the history of the church. The disciples had a saying when they were trying to fish for men. They used to say, hmm, they were among us, but they weren't with us. Now think about that. Those people were among us. They were in the sanctuary. They were with us no matter what we did. But they they were among us, but they weren't with us in spirit. So they're not like you. I told this to my daughter not too long ago. I said, the scripture teaches there's an us and there's a them. They're not the same. This is what this parable is saying. And sometimes the net catches more than at other times. Remember when Jesus told them? They hadn't caught one thing. And he told them, well, go over here on the other side. And they're like, well, we already been here, you know. But when they did, a lot more fish was in the net. What's happened is, you and I are not to get discouraged because we don't see the increase of a slow, slow process and get results. People, when you witness to somebody, we want them to get saved right then and right there. But that doesn't usually happen. 
Now and then it does. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will read that through 6 through 8, it talks about that a little bit. Because there was Apollos, there was Cephas, there was like three or four of them. They all did something different in order to gain that increase. God's word will never return to him void or empty. Never. Never. You keep sowing seeds into the lives of people, and God will touch the lives of their hearts some way. The good are gathered, the scripture said it, into containers, the bad are cast away. Now, this is a very painful part of the scripture. The dragnet itself cannot distinguish between the good and the bad as it's pulled through the water. It just, it just grabs them all. It gathers the good and the bad. But that separation, listen to me, separation occurs when that net has been full and it's been pulled to the shore. The scripture plainly says it. The angels of God are coming to do the separating. Not the church. Not the church. And not any one person. Now, this little mini teaching that I'm giving you this morning, I pray with all of my heart that you get it inside of your soul. I wish the other there were more people here to hear it because it's very, very important. It'll change your life. What happens is this. It's a fact that when man judges, he makes mistakes. That word judge, this is where we get this word. You and I as believers are to never judge another person. It means to pass sentence on them, to form an opinion on something, to criticize and to blame them. It would be like this. Well... I would never do what they did. No, you would probably do worse. It's been my opinion. I've watched too many people say that. They turn around and do worse. Don't point your finger at anyone unless you want to deal with those three that are coming back to you. I know you're not going to shout me down on this, but I'm still going to teach it to you. There are three very practical reasons why no man or no woman can judge another person. Number one, a person has to be judged for their whole entire life. They are not to be judged for one single act or for a particular period of their life. No one sees another person's whole life. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's happened to me. I don't know what's happened to you. So you can't judge me. I can't judge you. No one sees that. In fact, very little of a person's life, their thought life, which is part of your life, or your activities is seen by any one individual. No one. You may say, well, Mama knows me real well. She may know you real well, but she don't know everything you think. Number one. Number two, a person may make a serious mistake or go through a stage of a terrible sin. I've seen this so many times in the church, I couldn't tell you. Then they fall, walk away from God, and then you have Christians that are willing to crucify them. Shame on you. No one should do that. Because by the eternal mercy and the grace of God, that individual may turn back to Christ and make the rest of their lives wonderful service for God. Amen. Amen. You don't know that. Lastly, any per person who is judged to be righteous today, that may be you this morning, that may be me. But guess what? You're still after you may fall into sin years later. You see, only God can see the whole of a person's life. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit can reveal, not for anybody else's sin, our own sin. Our own sin. It's been my experience with this. If you will quit pointing your finger at other people and look at your own life, you'll learn to walk humbly before your God. 
Only God can see and know the facts that led up to that person sinning. Facts within that person. Facts without that person. Pressure. People pressure does a lot of things to us within us and without us. You don't know what kind of relationships within that circle. Relationships without. Only God can know a person completely and fully, accurately. Know all the ramifications of every thought and act and stage of your life. Amen. You can read the whole book of Romans chapter 14 with that. Now, however, I've taught you this before. You are to be a fruit inspector. That word inspect is not judge. The word inspect means to look at them carefully, to examine them. Examine them. What's going on in their lives? Are they producing fruit in their lives? of the Spirit. You and I as believers are meant to inspect the lives, the fruit of other believers. You call yourself an, a believer, I'm going to look at your fruit. That's exactly what he's telling you. I'm not judging you. You see, we get those two words mixed up. The fruit of the Spirit, you and I are supposed to be judging. Are you walking in love? Do you have joy? Do you have peace? Are you, do you have a little self-control when you want to lose your temper? Do you walk in the spirit to say, you know what? I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I've been a jerk today. Hey, I was last night. I could have eaten nails last week. I was fit to be tied. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be screamed at. I don't like somebody trying to tell me my job. I know my job. That's right. Are you producing that fruit so people can see it? Judging is another issue. The world does that to you. Oh, I got this one. I got it last week from somebody. Well, you're just not a very good pastor, Pastor Linda. I got it. Right, Pastor? If I'd have got to them, they'd have seen what kind of pastor I'd have been. The Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Didn't say a thing about a woman. <laughs> you know I'm being facetious. Be careful. Oh, how many times have you stood up for right and did right and been accused, well, you're not a very good Christian. 90% of those times, that comes from unbelievers. You just don't measure up. The reason you don't measure up is because they got a different sliding scale than Jesus does. You know in your own heart, are you producing fruit? I, I personally have lived by this one statement most all of my life, and I only say this very humbly because if it hadn't been for God, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't ever judge another person. I don't judge them. I learned this when I was in my teens. I was 19, 20 years old when I learned it. I felt such deep compassion for Christians that fell by the wayside. They walked away from God. It broke my heart. I understand why now I felt that. Because in my heart today, any time you hurt people that I know that you're hurting, I hurt. I cry over you. Why? Because I love you so much, and I want you to make heaven. And I know that the enemy is great out there. He pulls us right and left all the time to get us away from one another. He tries to destroy any good thing that God ever does. When you see a brother or sister falling by the wayside or hurting or doing anything, you need to remember one thing. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. You need to learn to say like I said, except for the grace of God, that could be me. It could be me and you. You see, the purpose of the angels coming forth was to separate the wicked from the just. These individuals, they have not changed their way of living for the kingdom of God. Now, I want to prove that to you. 
You mean we're supposed to be changing? Absolutely. Little by little, step by step. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. There are 11 passages there where Peter talks about it. He said, you are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to add virtues to your life. In other words, when you gain one virtue, get going on another one. Why? He said, then you won't be short-sighted. You won't fall at every little thing that comes upon you. You won't get mad and throw a fit and walk away from God. That's why it's important. Yes, we all sin. We all do things that we're not proud of. But get up. Don't lay down and let the enemy stomp on you. Get up. Keep going. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Learn to walk in his love and his ways. What happened to these individuals is they're not becoming good. Listen to me closely. Brushing shoulders with and living among, fellowshipping and worshiping with good people will not make a bad person good. It won't. We like to think it would. But most of the time, if you put a one bad apple in a big bin of all good ones, guess what's going to happen? Every one of them are rotten. You see, the badness in us sometimes overwhelms us because we don't like to think we're bad. I don't know about you, but I don't like to think that. But guess what? I do have a bad side. Everybody does. But a bad person who's bad all through their life, they're going to be bad at the end of their lives. I know a woman that's been mean and nasty for, let's see, she's in her 90s now, and she's still mean and nasty. She hasn't had her mind renewed. She hasn't been had the finger of God touch her heart with love. You see, that's what Christianity is all about. It's about God putting his finger in your heart and walking in love, walking in humility before your God. Because if it's not for God's grace, it could be you. Amen. Soon and very soon, the bad will be separated from the good. Christ will separate when he comes back at his second coming, that's when it's going to happen. If a person lives bad all their life, even if they're in the church and among the good, he, they will not be allowed to continue with the good. Christ taught this over and over again and again. He said, you will separate from God. I'll prove it to you. I won't go into them, but... Because eventually we will. Matthew 25, 32, that's the separation of the sheep from the goats. They're in the church. They're not in the world. They're in the church. You see, we're going to look at this. How many of you know the story of the wheat and the tares? Same thing. It means the same thing. They've got to grow together, but there's going to come a day of separation. I guarantee you. As of right now on earth, good and evil coexist. Can you say amen? But not so at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I finish this by saying, Jesus plainly told us this, either make the tree good or either make it bad. You know, one lady said one time, well, I personally think there's a little gray in between the Bible. I thought, you must not be studying the same Bible I'm studying. Because <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it's black and it's white and it's red all over the world, by the way. If you're going to make the tree good, do good. If you're going to make it bad, how many times? We don't have to make ourselves bad and work for the devil. We're good at that. I don't know about you, but I know most people, and they were really good when they were bad. You know a few like that? They were pretty, pretty good. Why is it so hard for us to be good? You know why it's so hard for us to be good? It goes against our nature. Because we are born into, it starts with an R, rebellion. We all like to think that our good is a whole lot better than it is. Amen. Yet, we need to, be, we need to strive to be good like who? Who is it you would classify good? I classify one person as good, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's our measuring rod. He's the one that we have to measure our walk with day by day. I don't know about you people, but I don't get my way every day. Although sometimes with Pastor, I get it more now than I used to. <laughs> That's right, I can beat him up. And I can run faster than he does. <laughs> Stand with me. <laughs> but I tell him all the time, we can be better than we are. Just because you've been saved for a long time, guess what, people? You can still become better than what you are. Every single day of our lives, we can learn to walk in God's goodness, His mercy, His grace to us because He is a good God. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, you see each and every person today under the sound of my voice. Father, we know that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving us, for creating in us a new heart, giving us desires that are meet with your will for our lives. Father, today, bless and keep your people. Help us, Lord, that as we learn to walk day by day, and to humbly submit ourselves unto you, Lord, that you be the one to guide us and to help us in every situation. Because, Lord, we know without you, we can't do it. We struggle too much within ourselves. And today we ask that you bless, you keep each and every person, those that were here and those that are not here today, those that are listening by the Internet, Father, I pray a special blessing upon them. Encourage them, strengthen them to do their very best for Jesus Christ today. We will be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for it in the name of Jesus today. Amen. Raise your hands for the blessing today. Father, bless your people. Bless their coming in. Bless their going out. Keep them. Love them. Make your face to shine upon them. And give them peace, joy, and love. Say, I receive it. And I'll give him the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.